My question is, um, why before the lunch we chant the two uh, long chants and to any other uh, meal we don't have this uh, prior, um, I don't know how you call it, but this prior chanting. The offering ceremony, yeah. Yes. In the Buddha's time, they actually had one main meal per day. Sometimes the more ascetic people had only one meal per day. To the present day, the Theravada tradition does not give food to monks uh, in the afternoon. That means after lunch, everything's over until next day breakfast. So the main meal of the day is lunch and that is the Buddha's meal. So we offer it to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and that's why we have those chants. These long chants in Zen temples, they usually chant them three times a day. But the offering ceremony comes only at noon. So we chant the long chants only once a day, morning and evening, little shorter ones. It's a meditation temple, not a ceremony temple. That's why the difference. The rest of it is not ritual. In fact, most of it is not just ritual or offering. First of all, the offering means correct relationship between you and all beings. That you don't keep that energy for yourself. You transform it and you transmit it to others for their benefit. Should they be in a body, human or animal, or they do not have a physical body higher or lower than this realm. And then this relationship changes your mind, opens up your consciousness. That's when the dance begins. The first two long chants, the Thousand Eyes and Hand Sutra and the Shurangama, if you chant them long enough, then it's like plugging yourself into a huge power plant. Clarity station as well. Keep going. More questions? If a Tantian is a center thing in the Zen um, tradition, then how come that in a Zen retreat the bows are not obligatory or a part of the schedule? Actually, bows are obligatory before chanting. You bow three times. Uh, morning, noon, evening, you do that. But we do not want to make uh, this physical exposure an obligation because some people cannot handle it physically. We recommend that people do that. And when they see the you know, wonderful effects of 108 bows, then they might choose to continue that on a regular basis. So we don't tell people what to do. We advise them, we instruct them, we teach them, and then they make their own decisions. What we call Buddha nature equals to your spiritual autonomy. In the state of its basic potential is just an option that you might use. Now, if you do practice and you make your own decisions to stay on the path and you do your bows and chants and sitting and whatnot, then it becomes real spiritual autonomy, clarity, and all the qualities that come out of this clarity, compassion, wisdom, selfless help, etc. But if I take away that autonomy at the very beginning because I think that you don't know or you are not capable of really perceiving and making the right decision, if I don't allow people to make mistakes, I take this spiritual autonomy away. You cannot teach freedom and responsibility by taking away freedom and responsibility. So it seems to be a little bit hard at the very beginning that we do not tell people what to do, that you always have a choice. And if you make the wrong choice, I don't stop you before you see it. But practice is the ultimate experience. And cause and effect is the ultimate teacher. My person is not really necessary. A teacher is as good as your path is. So if I could point you to your path, if I can help you grow, if I can help you lose your illusions, then I have done my job. But I cannot give you your Buddha nature and cannot take away your karma. And even if I could, I should not do that. Okay? That's why we don't tell people to bow, bow, bow. You recommend that. And then your experience will convince you. Okay? Uh, on my way here, I met my, a few people that each one went in a different spiritual uh, path. And um, like those paths, I didn't choose them. So I wonder 
how can a person know that he's on his right way and he's not getting um, like an Osho style? Uh, he's not in a cult like an Osho style. From the side I see people goes, mm, what? What's wrong with Osho? So, somebody wanted that, they got that. I think the Oregon experiment was a great teacher. Too bad if people got traumatized, but that's another matter. They wanted it, they got it. So you should know what you want, and that's the underlying element of any choice you or others make. But if, if you don't know what you want, then you're just wondering, maybe, 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 but really, look at your homework, what you have to do, look at your freely chosen entertainment, what you want to do, and that lines it up, okay? You have certain questions, certain traditions give better answers, seemingly. Some others seem irrelevant. So make your own choice based on your own honesty and sincerity inside. And don't worry about others. That's okay, you ask the legitimate question, no problem. <laughs> but why others make their own choices? None of your business. It's their business. Just like your business and yours alone is why you make your choices. What brought you here, which is wonderful, okay? So Zen is good for you. Why? Because you are here. What else can I say? Okay. <laughs> Joke aside, if you look at people's choices, if it's under-informed or misinformed, that's when they suffer. And that's their own lack of understanding themselves or understanding the other person or understanding a tradition. And we all make these kinds of mistakes when we are young, sometimes even later too. So the only way is to try and see what that particular tradition or practice brings to you. What you become by being a Zen practitioner for five years or 20 or 50, or lifetimes. So what kind of person do I become by practicing this or that religion, tradition, etc., etc.? That's the ultimate. It's not what it looks like, tastes like, feels like, sounds like. That's irrelevant. That's just the tool. But what is the result? The result is us. The result is our soul. The result is our own clarity, or the lack thereof. So if you look at that, cause and effect really teaches us what it means to be following a certain path. Never lose that. I still have to say one more thing. Still, you are okay <laughs> to say one more thing. Go yeah, ahead. because if we're here for others and you see a friend or a family member goes on a, on a path that um, has doesn't have good uh, consequences or you see that he goes on a bad path, then I stay neutral and I just don't touch it? Define bad path. What is it? Okay, so it can be any, any way, any path. Be if specific. Go... Like, if it causes suffering, degradation, disintegration, unclarity, unhappiness, that's bad path. That's what we okay. define as wrong. Because everybody wants happiness and love and compassion and wisdom, yada, 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 but we don't get it. Because we make wrong choices, all right? So then I just helped you out with your question. Do you see that? No. Oh, more <laughs> practice necessary, but... Returning to the original point, what you said, you cannot and should not influence the choices of others but you can inform them if they listen to you, okay? So you can ask that family member or friend, look, you do this and you become more upset, easier to provoke, uh, less patient, less tolerant. Is this what you want? This is sharp okay. enough. So you can inform them by reflecting cause and effect, or you can inform them that, listen, you joined school XYZ. And do you see those who have been practicing school XYZ for 50 years? Do you want to become like them? Because chances are you will be. So you have plenty of ways to help others without telling them what to do. Okay? Yes. I have
have uh, a few things that I had in mind for the next year, but I don't know which one I will um, push, let's say, or go for. And on the other hand, I see my teacher, he plans for years ahead. So, I mean, I, I bet that everyone has those points that they don't know. Then how do you plan in advance and for years to go um, when you have those dilemmas? Dilemmas are included in the plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> have a basic direction and don't worry about the details so if you follow the constellation on the horizon as the basic direction for your ship like the North Star okay then you don't worry about the little waves or what kind of fish would come up from the water just stay clear of obstacles keep your direction clear and keep your order of importance very, very clear. So if you know what's important, who's important, then it sets up a hierarchy naturally within yourself. And then you make the right decisions. And if you don't lose your direction, then everything will be fine. How can I make the order more clear to me? You should ask, what is my true job? Okay. <laughs> That's quite big. Okay. Uh, I'm a Korean, so uh, I, exper <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I experience here European uh, Zen Buddhism, uh, Zen Buddhism as a European, uh, how can I say, Korean European Buddhism and Korean traditional Buddhism. I experienced several times. And so, uh, a little, I think, different between here, Wangangsa in Hungary, and uh, in Korea, some, any, uh, some temple, Buddhist temple. Of course, temple. we eat less and, kimchi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, my question is, um, here, here, uh, the, how can I say, participant uh, do uh, more meditation and then uh, in Korean. So in Korean, um, the Korean lay, uh, Buddhistic layman. And so my question is, um, here the uh, uh, participants uh, Try to put down in dungeon, dungeon, and uh, maybe in Korea more um, compassion. So my my uh, question is: with with dungeon, with jazen, really uh, do you uh, uh, expect uh, the participant the participants? <laughs> Uh, have uh, or, the, or again uh, gain uh, compassion? Absolutely. It's a rightful expectation. Why? True compassion comes out of the experience of oneness. When you think, your mind and my mind are different. When we cut off thinking, your mind, my mind become one. That's the root of true compassion, not some emotional posture. Emotional postures get exhausted very quickly and they can change. So when compassion is superficial, you can see that on a stormy day, it just changes into enmity. And I don't care about you anymore. Don't come to me. I don't want to help you. And even if until then for months or years, it's, oh, you are my best friend. I'll help you no matter what. I feel what you feel. This was just emotion based. Not good, not bad, but not stable. This is stable. So when you have no thinking, not moving mind, this complete oneness, then out of that comes clarity and compassion and wisdom. So the root of that is don't know. The root of that is one mind, not some kind of karma. 
And that's why it's a natural outcome of our practice. So we have many Kongans that develop compassion. And if you come to the interview room and face them, you can see how compassionate you really are in your action or in your speech or in your thoughts and emotions. But if you want to establish that on some kind of karma, in the most crucial moment that karma fails you, leaves you, when you have to establish something really clearly, rely on it, depend on it, just then it's gone. But uh, here they have a really strong karma and this karma really they can re, uh, and, uh, erase I, I, I cannot imagine. Bosani, you come to chant with us every day. Why? Don't you also want to transform this super heavy karma into something else? We can, but if we don't practice, we cannot. And if you want to have an intellectual explanation, I can inform you that no explanation will suffice. In fact, by wanting this explanation, you want to have a shortcut that your intellect runs forward and by some reasoning you make it simpler, shorter, easier and none of that would happen because intellect makes it more complicated, it makes it slower and makes it more difficult. So don't want to know. Also, don't attach to your feelings. But if you perceive the moment very clearly, you will see, you will feel, you will perceive what the other person has in his or her heart or mind. That's the root of compassion. And I urge you to do that instead of just dealing with your own thoughts or dealing with your own emotions. You're sensitive, that's wonderful. You're smart, that's wonderful. But have the tolerance and have the center that this karma does not define you or would not determine who you are. And then you can be compassionate and strong anytime, any place, any situation. All right. As maybe here, all of uh, the participants has problem, lack uh, back on and uh, with body. Now it's very uh, hard. So my question is, you know, I have problem with my sickness, and uh, when someone uh, problem with uh, the body. How can the man, uh, how can, how can I uh, practice? Could you uh, give advice? Yes, good doctor necessary. <laughs> Get some treatment for the no, body, otherwise you doctor. cannot practice. Then you take out the mental roots that caused the physical problems. But when you already have physical problems, then this kind of practice cannot really help you effectively. You need a fix, hospital or treatment center, hanyak, honey one, honey sa, then it's okay. But when you, when you want to have healing effect from Zen, you will be disappointed because you don't use these specific techniques for good reasons. We want to prevent it. We want to take the underlying cause away. We want to take away those illusions that would cause you sickness. Okay? Uh, for example, um, cancer. When I have cancer, and then I, how can I do? I have to tell you, you have to go to a cancer hospital or a treatment center where you trust the doctor and the way they want to treat you. Sorry, there is no other way. And when the cancerous tissue is removed, then you work on the mind. Then you work on the karma to become very clear and not to repeat that again, so that the cancer would not manifest again. It doesn't mean that Zen is irrelevant, but Zen is relevant in the right way. Okay? We never take the job of doctors and hospitals and treatment centers. All right?